Thank you so much, Hunter. Thank you so much. I appreciate it and I appreciate everyone here. So I do have a deck to share if you wouldn't mind giving me X. Perfect. Well, as he gave you a big overview, Parento is focused on helping address the motherhood penalty and the difficulty of implementing a paid parental leave program and support program for employees. And so what I'm here today to do is to provide an overview of how you can get the most out of a parental leave policy. How do we address the motherhood penalty and the challenges that working parents face based on the best practices that we've learned and data that we've gathered? Because under our program, over almost 100% of employees, both men and women, have not only returned to work, but have returned to work full time after taking parental leave. And so we want to share our learnings with you of how to craft a paid parental leave policy that's effective in addressing challenges moms face, face and then making sure they're getting the resources that they need, but also making sure that we're addressing the needs of non-birth parents as well, because that's incredibly critical to addressing the gender wage gap. So first and foremost, we want to set the stage, a lot of this data you're probably familiar with, that so many women will turn over after they have a child, generally between 30 and 40 percent of moms quit the year they have a child. Many of them come back to work only to turn over later. But something that we see a lot of people aren't familiar with is the fact that moms will actually quit before they have a child, that there is preemptive turnover before employees ever welcome a child during this period of life. And so what we want organizations to be able to understand is the importance of establishing a parental leave policy, not just for those who are actively having a child, but those who are actively building their families and in their childbearing years. And importantly, when you do that, you do reduce the risk of turnover, especially when people are having their children. But from there, how do we make sure that employees not only come back, but come back full time and are as close to their career tracks that they were on before they had their child or started building their families uh, afterward? And that's one of the biggest challenges that we see a lot of child companies face is like, yes, we have a paid family policy, but how are we making sure these employees aren't still taking a step back from work? And so to highlight how important this is, employees will preemptively quit organizations when they're in their family building years. We see a lot of organizations will hold off on being paid parental leave. It's not a problem for them. Problem is, is that it's actually just a hidden problem that employees are actually going to quit because they know they're going to have a child in the next couple of years and your organization isn't family friendly. And one way to tell this is to determine what your birth rate is versus what it should be based on your demographics. And so if you have birth rates that are below what your population should have, you're probably losing that talent because they're had, choosing to leave to go and have their children somewhere else. And so this is actually something that we see can drive average employee tenure, that employees will stay longer with an organization specifically to take advantage of a paid parental leave policy because they know they're not going to be able to get a generous policy elsewhere as easily. And so they're going to stick with you, take that paid parental leave, and they can add years of tenure to their service. Importantly, that we hear so much about the gender wage gap, but we don't really hear about the earning disparity between women who do have children and women who don't have children. So really what we need to address is the long-term ramifications of parenthood on employees, because employees who have kids, and particularly women when they have their children, are typically going to see a 20 to 25% decline in their average earnings relative to women who don't have children. So it's really not about gender. It's about the structural support or lack thereof when employees have children. And this has long-term ramifications. So it's really important that we build in a system for employees that provides the support that they need. So we want to make sure that you're doing more than just implementing a paid parental leave policy and that these employees are getting the non-financial things met because you're going to lose talent even if they return to work. So one thing we recognize is that you have to sometimes sell this internally, that you can't just say, hey, we want to offer paid parental leave and support for our employees. We need to sell this internally to get finance and senior leadership on board. So one thing we look at for a lot of organizations and, and for you that are in DNI or have ownership of DNI can look at is what is the gender breakdown amongst each age bracket within your population? So looking at how many women versus men you have between 20 and 24, 25 and 29 years old, and in each age bracket. And this is an example here of what I'm talking about, because what we can see is this organization has no trouble hiring women under the age of 29. But all of a sudden, once they turn 30, they start to lose women. And what's really happening there? They're building their families. Most people are starting to have children in their late 20s, maybe early 30s in many places. And then all of a sudden, they start building their families. Their companies are meeting their needs, and so they're turning over. And so this is a telltale sign 
for us that this organization is not addressing family planning in any meaningful way and employees are making career decisions around it. Because you can also see that with the fact that the breakdown between genders between 40 and 44 returns to the you know pre-childbearing years where women generally have children that are five to seven years old and in kindergarten and in school. And so they're more less impacted by the lack of support and structure that the organization has. But if you look at this data and you don't see that disparity, don't think that this isn't necessarily an issue. You do need to look at a couple different things. One, are your moms returning full time? Are they staying with you after they have a child for at least 12 months? Because you can see high return to work rates, even if you don't have a good policy. But then six, nine months later, those moms are turning over or they're taking a step back from work or they're not being promoted at the same pace as they were before they had their children. And then you also want to make sure that if you're looking at this specific data that we're, we're kind of showing an example of here, that if you don't have the big decline in women versus men in the older years, you want to dive deeper and determine are these employees being backfilled by other women? So women in those age brackets actually have a lower median tenure or salary relative to their male colleagues. That's also another way to dive deeper and so to determine if this is an issue, because you can then use this to sell that internally and say, look, we're losing all this talent. We need to have a more robust solution here. So with all that said, what makes a good paid parental leave policy? So there are a couple of things, obviously, that you can play with length of leave and percent of pay are some of the easiest, and then we'll dive into the structure from there of how you actually structure that. A couple of things that organizations sort of forget are the logistical items of parental leave. You generally are going to have a hard time finding a daycare that will take a newborn under three months old. There are a few out there that will do so, but most employees are going to struggle to find that. So if an employee can't even get 12 weeks of leave to get their kid old enough to go to daycare, they're going to struggle with going back to work on time. And that's not a great experience for that employee. So you increase the likelihood of that employee turning over. Second, paid parental leave really isn't about healing from childbirth. It's really about the transitional period of time. We see an overemphasis on the needs of birth moms, especially the healing process. That is an important part of this, and it shouldn't be entirely overlooked, but do not overemphasize the needs of birth moms to the detriment of non-birth parents. Because for those of you who don't have kids and haven't got to this, a lot of parents don't immediately love their newborn. They bring that child home and there's not that in initial immediate bond where this is the most important child in your life. It, it takes weeks or, or months to build that bond. And so you need to allow the time to do that. Otherwise, these employees are going to have emotional or mental issue, health issues because you're interrupting that process and that worsens things for the family and that employee. But importantly, the longer length of leave that you offer, you're going to see higher retention rates and ROIs. If you offer 16 weeks of paid parental leave, you're pretty much going to see a 100% return to work rate for your employee population. And those employees are more likely to stay with you versus if you offer just eight or 10 weeks. But generally speaking, what we recommend is a bare minimum starting point for you to actually start seeing returns on investments, higher return to work rates, higher full-time return to work is about 10 weeks of leave. Because when you get the 10 weeks, you can allow the employees to then use paid time off to get themselves a 12 weeks of leave, to get their child old enough to get to daycare. And that's really important that you offer this to everybody, not just birth moms, because you never know what the partner at home has through their employer and they may struggle to get the child old enough to go to daycare. For those who have built paid friendly policies before, 10 weeks might look a little short to you, and that's totally true, but this is kind of the bare minimum starting point for organizations that might be apprehensive around offering parental leave because if you offer less time than that, it's not great with regards to retaining employees at higher rates versus just offering disability for birth moms or nothing at all. Now, a lot of times companies think that they need to offer fully paid parental leave, which isn't necessarily true. So you don't necessarily need to offer 100% of salary, but you do need to make sure that employees are taking home enough money so that they can take the time that they need. And so first and foremost, the bare minimum is actually more than 60%. Employees can't afford to give birth or go through the cost of adopting or fostering a child, then pay for daycare, and then take a 40% pay cut while they're on leave. It's too expensive a period of life for them to afford that. So most employees are not able to afford to live on just 60% of pay for you know, 12 to 14, 16 weeks. So it needs to be a higher level of pay. 
and we recommend minimum of 75% of pay. That's a good balance between what employees are going to need financially and any potential budgetary concerns that the organization may have, because we know finance is asked to approve this. If you can do 100%, great, you should, but if budgets are a little bit tighter, we strongly recommend going a little bit lower in percent of pay instead of doing 100% to 75% of pay and then going longer. So if the choice is between say eight weeks at 100% of pay or 10 or 12 weeks at 75% of pay, we would strongly recommend the latter. Go longer at a lower percent of pay because the amount of time employees need is the number one factor in the success of that program. Our moms are going to be able to return to work on time. And the answer is going to be yes, if they have that longer length of leave. Now, with regards to birth moms and everything new parents are facing, especially for their children, there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind that are going to be critical for after the employee returns to work. First, the employees and birth moms are generally not going to be cleared as fully healed until about week six or eight after giving birth. That's generally how long disability lasts, but the reality is that moms aren't really ready to go back to work at that point. They're certainly not ready to take care of their child by themselves at that point. We also need to be aware that postpartum depression is typically not going to kick in if it happens. It's not going to happen until a few months after the child arrives, and then employees like to potentially be at work by the time postpartum depression sets in. So you should be on the lookout for the and signs of postpartum depression for your birth moms when they return to work because it can come well after the child has arrived. And then importantly, don't forget, daycares generally won't accept children under the week, under 12 weeks old. And importantly, during this time, while I'm emphasizing birth parents, adoption and foster placements is an emotionally fraught issue. This is not something where a child comes to the home and two weeks later they're bonded with these new parents and they love each other like a normal loving family. You know, that's not how it works. There's a very long, arduous process. A lot of children that are being adopted have trauma that they have to work through that can cause issues with regards to the bonding process. So even adopted parents are going to need significant more time. So don't overemphasize just birth moms here either. Now, with regards to the policy structure, what we tend to see are policies that, again, overemphasize the needs of birth moms to the detriment of others. And we understand that nobody else has that physical impact of birth except birth moms, and they need that time to heal. But when you overemphasize birth moms and offer more time to moms who can birth than anybody else, what you're really saying to them is like, yes, you need time to heal. We want to take care of you, but you don't really need anybody to take care of you. Like you're fine on your own. After six weeks, you can take care of the baby. So that's really what's happening. And so moms don't really appreciate it when dads are forced to go back to work or their partners forced to go back to work because they weren't able to get more time because that partner didn't give birth. And you also have to remember that LGBTQ parents are five to seven times more likely to adopt a child. So policies that offer more length of leave to women that give birth are inherently providing insufficient amounts of time to everybody else, and particularly those for adopting or fostering. And there again, go into this arduous and emotionally fraught process. So you're going to run into issues there, especially with your LGBTQ parents who are significantly more likely to adopt. And for this crowd, as we've been discussing, gender equality and equity is very important on this topic. Having access to paid paternity leave is one of the best things that you can actually do for women. Because for every month of paid parental leave that a dad takes, increases mom's earnings by 7%. Because she's able to take the time that she needs and she's more likely to return to work on time and less likely to turn over. And is the father and mother are going to share the child rearing burden more equitably. And so less burden is be forced onto that mother because you're creating the dynamics more equal from the get-go rather than forcing mom to be the primary caregiver and she's taking up 70, 80% of the burden. So we strongly recommend making sure dads not only have time, but you're encouraging them to take that time. But again, we recognize the limits of reality that senior leadership may not be on board with gender neutral policies or may want shorter policies. If that's the case, never do a maternity paternity policy. One, that just reinforces things we're trying to get away from. But two, it runs into discriminatory issues with EEOC regulations. And so if you do have to have two different policies, do primary and secondary, but write primary caregivers, not as birth mothers, but whoever self-selects as the primary caregiver so that dads are legitimately able to select, they are the primary caregiver. Now, with regards to now asking your finance team for budget, you're going to need to give them a number and help them out with that. So you have to remember a few things. 
paid parental leave is a compensated absence. It, you have to treat it like a PTO, basically, from an accounting standpoint. So there has to be a number. You can't just take it out of the budget. It's not free. If it were free, you could just take it out of the budget. Why not just offer six months of parental leave? Why not just offer nine months of parental leave? And it's because there's a cost. So you need to make sure you estimate that cost and give it to finance, and they'll probably work with you on it. But a few best practices for figuring out what it's going to cost. One, never use historical data, especially if you don't have a paid friendly policy. Your historical birth rates and adoption rates are going to be significantly lower than what they should be and where they will be after you implement the policy. So you need to use the demographics of your population, what are the birth rates and adoption rates for people in your population, and use that to build your expense, your model. Importantly, for most firms, you should see between 3 and 6% of all employees having a child in any given year. That's a typical birth rate. If you have an older population, it might be toward the tail end or below that. And if you're particularly young, it could be above that. But you should also expect that this can be a highly volatile cost year to year, especially if you are not a particularly large firm. It can vary. One year you could have a 3% birth rate. The next year you could have a 7% birth rate. So when you're modeling this in and building the expenses, you need to account for the fact that you could have that higher birth rate and that should be your cost because otherwise you'll underfund it. But if you offer short-term disability insurance as an organization or employees have access to statutory disability or PFL, the states, you can use those to reduce the cost. So you can make sure that paid currently runs concurrently with those items and it can run concurrently with disability. So that can also help you reduce the cost of parental leave policy. For sometimes it can reduce it maybe 20 to 40% depending on your demographics. Or you can find a paid parental leave insurance out there somewhere. I'm sure there's probably one at least. Now, one of the most important things we see now that we kind of discuss at a very high level how to structure our basic paid parental leave policy and what the minimum should be. One of the key things we constantly see with existing policies, they're effectively just PTO. It's you get 10 weeks of parental leave and that's it. There's nothing more to the employees, no resources, no structure around how it should work. There's nothing for the employees, nothing for their team. And employees are left to their own devices. Those policies do not work nearly as effectively as a policy built around the resources employees need. And so what I'm talking about is making sure you're providing support to these employees before, during, and after the leave. You're talking about parenting resources, emotional resources, career and work-life integration resources, and making sure that managers and supervisors and even the team get training about what that employee is going to need when they return to work. It's very, very common that a manager doesn't necessarily understand what that new parent's going to need, especially when, frankly, it's a man, or especially a man without a child who has a birth mom coming back to work, doesn't understand their needs and indirectly alienates them and just drives them to turn over six, nine months after they come back to work. You want them to be more aware of their needs, both the emotional and the toll that's taken, but also the logistical needs, the calendar and scheduling needs, the pumping needs, and all of these factors. Make sure you have resources made readily available to these employees and that you're proactively engaging them with them. Don't make the employees look through your handbook and decipher everything. Give it to them. Make it easy for them. Welcome them back to work. Give them the resources. Make them aware of it and slowly onboard them. Importantly, for those who don't have children and have never been through this and have not seen this firsthand, there are a couple of sort of logistical pieces of advice we strongly recommend. Do not make employees Google anything. When an employee announces a parental leave, guide them through FMLA, the different leave entitlements, filing for short-term disability. A lot of birth moms find it insulting that they have to file for disability. This is not a disability to them, but so they don't oftentimes understand why they need to do that. Deciphering paid family or state disability can be a nightmare. Walk them through that, support them, or have a third-party resource do that or leave admin do that. We've seen so many parents turn over, even with paid parental leave, just because it felt like the company didn't care about them. They were left for their own devices and the onus was on them to figure everything out. Don't do that. You also should be aware, especially when you're pushing for a paid parental leave policy, is that newborns do not sleep through the night before two months old, in the best of circumstances, but most will not be sleeping through the night until six months or longer. And this is really important because what that means is even if you have a a policy for men, it's not very long. It means these employees that are welcoming children are not coming to work well rested. You know, if you're getting three hours of sleep a night on average, that employee is not productive. They are barely getting anything done in most situations. So forcing them to come back to work is not going to be very effective and it's going to breed sleepy, resentful employees. So be aware of that when you're building your policy and you're talking about how much time to give to employees and 
what your senior leadership may be saying about that. Importantly, you also need to be aware that the priorities are obviously going to change. And this is particularly important, again, if you're forcing employees to take too little leave, that they don't necessarily have a daycare option. Work is never going to beat out taking care of that child. And so if employees don't have the resources that they need to care for the child, they don't have access to daycare or child care, work is going to suffer and that increases the likelihood of the employee turning over. We also find when we talk to parents, they're obviously going to not be able to work as many late nights or not work as many hours. They may work more at night, but taking a break during the day to take care of personal things. They're going to need to take more PTO to take care of their child. Kids get sick all the time. Make sure you're flexible and allow that. But we also see if there's less tolerance for the BS that they deal with at work, especially with managers who don't understand their needs. They're not going to be as tolerant of that. And that's one reason we can see turnover after the employee returns to work is this what the company is doing, how they're treating working parents doesn't work, and they're sick of it. So this also then begs the question about how do you fund daycare? Daycare funding is obviously very beneficial, but when you're looking at what you need to do, what retains parents, what's going to help you promote them into leadership, daycare funding is very limited in its impact there. Multiple studies have indicated that paid parental leave is far more effective in retaining employees, especially women, than funding daycare, especially if you're not making significant contributions to the cost of daycare. If daycare costs twenty thousand dollars, and you're only giving five hundred dollars. That's nice, and it's certainly appreciated, but it's not really addressing the underlying issue. When employees are coming back, you also need to address the emotional challenge that they're going to deal with. One of the topics that our parent coaches regularly discuss with parents before leave, and then when they come back, is guilt. A lot of parents feel guilty about taking parental leave, but then. On the flip side, when they come back to work, they feel very guilty about returning to work and leaving their child at daycare and feel like they're abandoning their child. That can be very distressing for parents and it can be very difficult for them to be productive and focus on work. And it can drive turnover because they're not sure that they can be good parents while working. So you wanna build in resources for them to address these things. You can have parent coaches. There are numerous resources and companies out there that do parent coaching that help with this. Then you also wanna make sure parents have access to the mental health resources. Sometimes those that parent guilt might not be, you know, seem like it needs therapy, but certainly giving them access to those resources, make them aware of it can be beneficial. But something that's cheap and free is setting up a parent ERG. <clears throat> we see it to be very effective, especially for new parents to be able to interact with and discuss their issues and challenges with other parents in the same organization because they're all dealing with the same policies. Good or bad, those policies have the same, you know, can cause challenges and it's very helpful for them to be able to connect with other people internally and to be able to share resources and information, even work together to make changes that benefit all of them. So kind of putting this all together, the things that you also need to do beyond just implementing that paid parental leave policy is training your team, both internally on these sort of human pe the people side, making sure they understand the needs of working parents, but making sure you're building in a training program for managers, supervisors, so they understand the needs of those working parents, otherwise you will lose talent. Make sure you're being proactive about how you're engaging these parents. Do not place the onus on them. Give them the resources they need. Hire vendors that can address this and have them provide those resources. When employees are coming back, provide slow on-ramps or provide intermittent parental leave so they don't need to come back right away and be right back at it. That oftentimes can backfire and cause issues. But at the same time, don't just take work away. We see a lot of parents who announce and then their managers don't put them on new projects or take projects away. Let them choose their work. Let them continue to work and contribute. And when they come back, let them choose the work that they're doing and allow them to continue to contribute. That's huge. And importantly, make sure that your overall policies are flexible enough for working parents, especially parents with young children, because that's where they need the most flexibility. Make sure that you have flexible work. A lot of people to work from home on days maybe they're supposed to come into the office. Make sure that you have daycare or backup care options available for these employees. Make sure that managers understand the scheduling challenges of these things and be flexible about scheduling and hours work because that's what's going to go a long way and helping these parents remain with you, especially moms. So kind of putting this all together, like giving everybody a lot of stuff, <laughs> kind of our basic recommendations of structuring everything. If you're going to offer paid parental leave, that's the most important thing you need to do. So you need to offer paid parental leave before anything else. A minimum policy of 10 weeks at 75% of pay, a gender neutral policy. 
Go longer and more generous if you can. Strongly recommend that. Make sure you're helping employees file for whatever is re required. Disability, PFL, state disability, it's a nightmare for everyone. Make sure you take care of it. Make sure your parental leave policies and broader policies are very oriented around the needs of working parents and not just for everybody. You know, it's not a one size fits all approach. Implement a training program for everybody around that employee. And most importantly, build and return to work resources. And you oftentimes are going to need third parties for this, whether it's parent coaching or other in mental health resources, but also adding in, you know, parent ERGs can go a really long way to helping everybody. So that's everything I wanted to get through. Hopefully you guys have uh, gotten something out of this. Feel free to add um, any questions you have in the chat. Yeah, so we do have a couple questions and I'm looking. So how do you quantify the candidates that come back are in the same places when they left to be considered for further growth opportunities, raises, or title and team growth opportunities? So that's something where it's very quantifiable, but also very qualitative. So one easiest is, is this employee returning to work full-time versus part-time? That's a very common one. But then now, are they actually able to achieve the work that they were doing before. So this is where the manager training comes in to help us identify specifically what should we be looking for for this employee. Are they as productive? Are the projects falling by the wayside? Are they on time? Are they hitting their deadlines of the projects? Are they delivering the same quality of work at the same pace as before? You may need to understand that for the first several months the employee returns that they may not be at the same pace, that things may fall behind a little bit, but that doesn't mean you should penalize them. What you should be able to do is make sure that you build an additional structure to support that employee if they're not hitting deadlines as quickly, if reviews from other team members, 360 reviews can be very helpful here, aren't coming in as well. So keeping the same structures that you had before that you took their leave afterward can certainly be helpful because it can give you that baseline gauge of performance versus before. And if you do identify issues, make sure you build in resources for that employee to support them. And then... <laughs> How do you talk about, another question we have is how do you speak to having children with the rising cost of childcare? Therefore, they may even want to stay at work, but can't because it's literally too expensive. Yes, this is very true, especially now. This can be very, very difficult for employees and can be the number one reason why they turn over. One of the things we recommend is working with other organizations or other companies in the area and helping set up daycares and childcares with them. Even if you're small, you can band together with a number of them. And there are many companies and some of our partners that can help you set up daycare specifically for your employee population and then all those others. So you can pull your resources for all of your employees and that can significantly reduce the cost of daycare and significantly increase the likelihood of employees returning to work. Because we do see employees on occasion can turn over because of the cost of daycare. So doing what you can to reduce that through those other you know, sort of creative mechanisms can make a big difference. <laughs> 